Welcome back. I'm so glad that you're joining me for another day. Yesterday, we explored the history of how the Jewish people got to Egypt, what happened in Egypt, and we explored the Exodus from a historical point of view. Today, I'd like to actually explore the deeper meaning, the, 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 the message within the story, because Torah presents itself often as a series of stories, and it was recorded as stories, history. These accounts happen to the Jewish people. But from a Kabbalistic point of view, Torah is not about the story. The story is just how the message has been embodied in this physical world. The message and the spirituality plays itself out in higher realms. And this spiritual realm called the physical realm, the physical world, is how, this, is how the message comes out. So we've got to draw the message out of the story. So it's not just a historical moment. It's not just a cultural happening. It's not just something that happened to my ancestors, but rather a very, very deep understanding of how this world actually works. So let's explore Egypt for a sec, because Egypt was a very, very spiritual place. The whole world was a spiritual place a few thousand years ago. Everyone was spiritually mindful. Everyone was conscious of the, of the life force and were looking for the life force within everything. That's what spirituality is. R the realization that there's something deeper than what meets the eye. And the different religious systems weren't just dog dogmas. They were actually different spiritual beliefs and understandings of how this world operates. So when the Jewish people received the commandment at Mount Sinai, thou shalt not have any other God. You can't have any other God. It's because the world has been created in a way that one could believe. One might think that there are all sorts of different spiritual forces. And the way we interpret that will decide what our belief is. In the pagan systems and in the systems adopted in Egypt, there were many different gods. There wasn't the idea of a unification. There wasn't that idea of monotheism. They had many different gods and each god played its role. And the world operated according to the different beliefs and the different traditions that came up. But it wasn't just blind belief. There were miracles. There was magic. There was very real physical evidence in their day-to-day -day life of a high spiritual being. And therefore, everyone was extremely spiritual, including Pharaoh. And we might explore that today. Let's start with the end. The end of the Pesach story is the splitting of the sea and the Jewish people leaving Egypt and going into the desert. And once they reached the desert, for 49 days they journeyed until they got to Mount Sinai. The importance of this is because the 49 comes to tell us something very interesting about what happened in Egypt. The 49-day journey to Mount Sinai was a process of 49 growth opportunities, 49 rungs, 49 steps that the people had to climb in order to reach a point spiritually, mentally, emotionally, so that they could experience the Sinai experience. So if they were going upward and they were getting to a point that they would be ready, had they fallen down that they needed to climb up? And according to Kabbalah, the answer is yes. When the people came to Egypt, they came from the land of Canaan. Jacob's sons had arrived seeking food and they settled in Egypt and life was good. They had farms, they had industry, and they had their belief and they had their spirituality. They were all monotheistic. They had their understanding of the world and they had their practices and their code of conduct. But as time went on, in the book of Shemot, the Torah relays an interesting little story. Vayokal Melech Chodosh. And as we explored in the history yesterday, a new king arose. And one of the things that this new king in Egypt did was he declared national projects. And he said, we are going to build things. We are going to build monuments to Egypt, monuments to us. We are going to build ourselves. And he recruited all the Egyptians and all the Jews, and he himself rolled up his sleeves to start working. This was very much part of a cunning plan and a way of enslaving the Jewish people. He couldn't just take the people and enslave them. He had to first disconnect them from their past, from their heritage, 
and he had to remove from them human dignity in order to be able to keep them in a state of enslavement. You can't just take a free person and enslave them. It doesn't work. Psychologically, it doesn't work. The person will rebel. And so therefore, Pharaoh hatches a plan which would slowly break them down. And within a period of time, most of the Jews had actually joined the workforce and had actually started building national projects. What they failed to notice was Pharaoh started pulling the Egyptians off the work until only the Jews were left building. Pharaoh stopped coming to the construction sites. The Egyptians were no longer workers. They were now masters. They were now foremen. And the only people left building were the Jewish people. And they didn't realize at first. And, not a, and when they did realize, they justified it. Well, we're the ones building. And so the slavery didn't begin with a whip. The slavery began with a mindset. The whips came shortly after, once the people wanted some more. And when Egypt started removing rights, and they want more rights, and Egypt's actually removing rights, then, so as to quell any chance of rebellion, the slave masters and the physical oppression began. And it was in this period of time that the people would begin to drop to the 49th level of impurity. Now, what is impurity? What is purity? They're very, very strange words. They're not words that we use in Western society. If someone uses the word impure, we automatically think religious connotations. And even then, it's very hard to quantify. So what I'd like you to actually see purity and impurity as are forms of connection or disconnection. When something is pure, when we say a child has such a pure face, it's radiating soul, really what we're saying is that there's a deep connection between the emotional and the deeper side and the facade that the child has. What you see on the outside is what you see on the inside. There's a complete connection. When there's a disconnect, what you're seeing is not what really lies beyond. So impurity is actually a spiritual disconnection. When one becomes impure, their soul is finding it difficult, their superconscious is finding it challenging to communicate with our subconscious and conscious. It's actually a breakdown between our soul, which is our life force, which is our connector to the creator, and our conscious self. And that is what we're talking about in purity. In the beginning, when the people first got to Egypt, there was this complete understanding of self and purpose in this world. It was when they started working, and they weren't working on world, on spirituality, but rather on monuments, on building ourselves up. It became a me focus about how great I am vis-a-vis -vis everyone else in the world. That is where the disconnect began. Now, Pharaoh was smart. He progressively led the people along. And Pharaoh is a very, very good analogy for the Yetzer Hara. The, the inclination to do things wrong. And we're not talking about wrong from a crime point of view. We're talking about wrong from a point of view of the offensive of the spiritual purpose of this world. Our Yetzirah is the part of us that helps us make decisions that aren't necessarily going to benefit the world spiritually or benefit or support personal growth. The Yetzahara is the decision-making process which we go through, which helps us make decisions to not only keep us alive, but actually turn us into our most centered point of gravity. And so everything we do revolves around that. It's what leads us to disconnect from higher purpose. So the Yetzahara will never get us to do. Our, our decision-making process never makes erratic decisions, very rarely. It always starts in the following process, and I'm going to use materialism as an example, and I hope not to offend you. We never one day wake up and realistically dream that we would like a Greek island, um, a Ferrari, our own boat, we'd like to not work, uh, we'd like to have, if you're a male, as many women as you want around you. If you're a female, whatever it is that you want, whatever type of man you want, and I'm sorry if I'm playing this into a very, very, very two-dimensional, shallow existence, but it's great that you're offended, because that means it's not what you're about. And no one wakes up one day like that. 
We start off wanting a little bit. We want a better car, a bigger home, because everyone else is doing that. We want a bigger meal. We want more. We want to do more. We want to dress better. Better being defined as more expensive. Better doesn't mean more effectively. Better doesn't mean it's cold, I want to wear more clothing. Better means better brand names, better colors, better compared to everyone else. And that's what the Yetzirah does. It takes us on this journey so that if you would look back after going on the journey with Pharaoh or with the Yetzirah, you'd look back and say, oh my God, I have changed over the years. The thing is the people weren't able to look back. Pharaoh had engaged their imagination and they were excited about this new building of monuments and this building of ego to a point that he was able to enslave them, schlepping bricks and mortar and being whipped by a slave master. When they got there, when they got to this stage of complete disconnect, where there was no longer an understanding of self or purpose of being, came their saviour, came Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu arrived on the scene and he said, People, I'm going to take you out. Hashem has heard your cries, we're leaving. And their response was, Get out of here. They had reached the second lowest point of disconnect where they could no longer imagine freedom. They could no longer appreciate the words of salvation, the idea of, of being free, of going to a desert, of self-governance. They were completely ensnared in the building and no longer even enjoyed it. They were being whipped. They weren't building monuments anymore. They were stuck on the hamster wheel, now just trying to keep up, trying to chase their own tail. That's why it's called slavery, because they were slaves to the wheel, going nowhere, no purpose. The slave achieves nothing in their own right. There was a tribe, Levi. Levi actually didn't get involved in the slavery. It was one-twelfth of the Jewish population. I don't know if statistically they were one-twelfth of every person, but they were one of the twelve tribes. And when the slavery first began, the tribe of Levi said, we're not getting involved, not because we disapprove of it, but it doesn't fit in with what we want to achieve in life. It doesn't achieve anything to do with spirituality. It's all about building up self as opposed to building up the world. It's all about physical monuments and what will be left behind after we die as opposed to creating change while we're alive. And so Levi, the tribe of Levi chose not to get involved. This was a very, very conscious decision on their part. And as a result, they actually weren't enslaved in the same way. They lost their rights, but they didn't have to build anywhere near the amounts that the rest of the Jewish people had to build. So what comes out is that the journey of impurity that the people went through was brought upon them because they didn't have the foresight or the realization in the, at the moment. And that's fine because we're all like that. We see and we respond to what we see. It's very hard to see beyond what we see. That's why Levi is a minority. So let's talk about the majority. Let's talk about us. In life, unfortunately, many of us are slaves. Western society doesn't have a, a very strong focus on higher spirituality. Western society values intellect, and Western society ultimately socially values tangibility, the things that we can buy. And that is why we are very much driven by the pressures of the people around us and what they have not necessarily what they achieve. But to prove to you that we haven't stooped and no one really gets to that 50th level, the fact is people do have midlife crises. People do wake up one day and say, I want more. And everything I've got is for naught. It doesn't make a difference to my life. It hasn't made me happier. People do wake up one day and say, I want out. I want a completely different element in my life. And that's where spiritual seeking be begins. So we can wait. We can either be like some of the people that do actually have that Moses moment of where someone or something approaches and says, do you want something more in your life? Or we can use Pesach as our check-in and look back and say, hey, in the last year, have I been enslaved to a pharaoh? Have I been working on purely promoting myself, on building myself, but with no greater purpose of why I'd be doing that? Or is what I'm doing actually driven from a higher purpose? It's not about the Joneses. It's not about keeping up with anything. And it's not about just making more of something, whether it be money or any other product, product or asset. That's what the inner message is. 
And that's why there was a 49 day journey after Pesach and remains so until Shavuot. We have a 49, seven week period, 49 day period in which we grow. Pesach is not about switching a, a switch on or off. It's not about just suddenly changing. It's about becoming aware so that we begin the change process. It's a Moses moment. It's a moment in which we read the Haggadah and we're going to explore the message of the Haggadah in a couple days. And we read it and we reflect on ourselves and say, are we slaves or are we living a life more like Levi? And if we are slaves, that's fine because most people are. That's the world we live in. Perhaps I want to use the Haggadah as my, and Pesach as my Moshe moment, the moment that Moses says, I can take you out. And perhaps we can then go through Pesach and not say, ah, it's another festival and it reflects something old. Perhaps Pesach has a very real message for me and you this year that we stop, we reassess, and we get off that hamster wheel and we begin a new journey through our own wilderness until we can find our promised land. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and we're going to explore this even further. Have a great day.